Hello, welcome to Light From Above. My name is David Kenny. I'm the preacher for the Church of Christ in Wadsworth, Ohio. Glad you could be with us today. I've been thinking a lot about Jesus and the things that he went through, the kind of person he was. You know, when you talk to people about Jesus, even people that don't necessarily believe in him, you know, they have very kind things to say about him. And I was thinking about some of the things that the New Testament says about him, or the Bible says about him. For, one, for example, in Acts 10, 38, he did good. It says how God anointed Jesus in Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. He did good. He didn't sin, and he didn't speak deceitfully. And that's, you know, that's a trait that uh, seems to be very rare <laughs> these days. It says in 1 Peter 2.22, Who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. He healed the sick. You know, a lot of people claim they can do it, but Jesus actually did. And you read here in Mark 1.34, says, Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. And Jesus, he cared about people. John 11.35, Jesus wept. He wept at the tomb of his friend and the friends that were around him mourning at Lazarus' passing. Jesus was touched by that. You know, Jesus, he was consistent you know, consistency, Jesus was. In Acts 1, verse 1, it says, The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. Jesus was consistent. There, there's no other man who's ever, that comes even close to being the kind of person of Jesus in Nazareth. And, you know, sometimes people talk about, you know, uh, I'm not making a comparison from a morality standpoint about John F. Kennedy, but they talk about the assassination, the killing of JFK, and some people will say, well, that was the crime of the century, and I'm not disputing that. But how would you classify the crucifixion of Jesus? He was innocent. and He wasn't just innocent. He was overwhelmingly innocent. He was a good, he was a good person. He did all these good things. It should outrage people. How would you classify that? That's the crime of humanity because Jesus died for all of humanity. I came across a statement. It was interesting. This is from the commentary on the New Testament. It was talking about the grave miscarriage of justice that Jesus went through. It says, By yelling for his crucifixion, the crowd now give the lie to the chief priest's implication that the crowd called Jesus their king. Pilate is disabused of suspicion both that Jesus wants to lead an insurrection and the crowd wants him to lead one. So Pilate asks what crime Jesus has committed. In contrast with the committing of murder by Barabbas and his fellow insurrectionists, Jesus had done nothing bad to which the crowd can point. So they only repeat their demand for his crucifixion instead of answering Pilate's question. Thus is exposed a miscarriage of justice. The addition of vehemently to the final yelling strengthens this expose. Jesus was brutally, maliciously murdered. He was set up for it. But it was set up for our benefit. But in this lesson, I want us to think about, you know, in the next two lessons, we're going to talk about sins around the cross. You know, there were, there were things that were committed that were wrong and that led to this event. Now, some people, you know, they want to charge the Jews with it. I can remember when the film The Passion of the Christ came out, and I'm not endorsing that or anything, but I can remember people, they were concerned about anti-Semitism, and they were right to be concerned about it, because that's what Hitler did. Hitler tried to, you know, any Jewish people, he would say that they're Christ killers, and he turned public opinion against the Jews. All Jews. Well, not all Jews were responsible for the crucifixion right there, of Jesus, even in that time. I mean, Jesus himself, Jewish. So, you know, I'm not talking, you know, I'm not talking about that. What we're talking about, what, what sins led to this event? Well, let me give you one right off the bat. Ignorance. Ignorance. It's, you know, it's sort of interesting. I was reading a little bit about ignorance, and it, I came across a university, a college, that had a group of students and it said, write down your greatest asset. And two people wrote down intelligence. And 
the report says they both misspelled the word intelligence. They're ignorant. Ignorance. That definitely had, as definitely a sin that led to the crucifixion of Jesus. Notice here in Acts 3.17 what it says. Peter plainly tells him, Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did also your rulers. Remember, J Jesus said in John 5, 46, For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. And, of course, no list would be complete without these words. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Luke 23, 34. Ignorance is one of the sins that led to the crucifixion. And ignorance is an excuse a lot of people are trying to use as if that is going to somehow work out for them, that God is going to accept that. You know, ignorance was one of the sins that led to the cross. Notice this passage. This is Acts 17, 30 through 31. It says, Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Ignorance will not be an excuse at the judgment. It led to the crucifixion. It led to the death of the Messiah. It led to the death of God's Son. How can you possibly think that ignorance is going to lead you to heaven? Really? It's not. Ignorance is not an excuse that God is going to accept. We need to be alert to that. We need to do our homework. We need to learn. We need to get rid of this ignorance. We need to examine the facts. Or we're going to make a big mistake. Just like the Jews back then, their ignorance led to a big mistake. It benefited all mankind, but it was a big mistake. Jesus was innocent. They killed an innocent man. Well, the next quote, the next, uh, excuse me, the next sin is envy. Envy. I was reading through some quotes and it said, uh, one person said, no man is completely a failure until he begins disliking men who succeed. Uh, Henrietta Myers said, envy shoots at others and wounds herself. Envy is very dangerous. And it's tearing apart our nation. It, it is. You know, we call it class warfare, whatever you want to call it. I mean, they have all kinds of names for it. But envy. Resent someone who can do something we're unable to do. We resent them for it. Resent someone who receives honors that we have not received. We resent them. Resent someone who has the courage to do something we don't have the courage to do ourselves. What do we do? We resent them. We resent someone for succeeding where we have failed. That's what we do. Resentment is a very, very serious matter. Remember resentment and what happened to Joseph? Sold into slavery? They were, his brothers were going to kill him. Why? Where did all this come from? Resentment. They resented him. They hated him. Why? Well, part of the reason why is because his parents showed favoritism Jacob showed favoritism to Joseph. He showed him the coat of many colors and they hated him. They envied him. They about killed him. And God was able to use that to save them. Envy the same way here too, isn't it? Remember, there was a king and this king was too afraid to go out and meet a, you know, meet a giant of a man named Goliath. He's afraid to. And he, he sends, you know, he allows this shepherd boy, David, to go out and fight Goliath. He kills him. And everybody's celebrating about it. And, and, and David is Saul's great ally. And, and they work together and they do all these things. Well, one day, you know, the women are out singing and dancing and, and they, you know, they say something that bothers Saul. It says, Saul has slain his thousands. And David, his ten thousands. You know what happens? Saul becomes envious of David. 
And that sets off a chain of events that I think Saul lost his mind. Envy, it's serious. It's a very serious problem. Envy was present at the crucifixion. Notice this passage, Matthew 27, 18. For he knew that they had handed him over because of envy. Well, envy? Who's he? He is Pilate. Pilate knew that they, who is they? The Sanhedrin. They had handed him, Jesus, over to him. Why? Because they envied him. The Sanhedrin envied Jesus. Why? Because he's the Son of God. He could do things they could not do. He taught things with authority they couldn't stand. They envied him. And that directly made them deliver Jesus to Pilate. In Proverbs 14.30, it says, A sound heart is life to the body, but envy is rottenness to the bones. It's serious. You know, some people, they might think these sins are rather trivial, but they're not. They're not trivial. What's the cure for it? What's the cure for envy? Let's look at 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4. It says, Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up. You see, one of the things that happened in World War II, Adolf Hitler persuaded a group of people to blame the Jews for their misfortunes. They were doing pretty well, but the German people were not. And Hitler was able to turn and say, you know, we wouldn't have all these problems if it wasn't for the Jews. And he stirred up envy. He stirred them up because of envy. And you know what happened. You know about the Holocaust and the millions of people that were killed. You know, Hitler, if you study the history of his life, it's a life full of envy. These things are very serious. Envy has destroyed preachers, it's destroyed elders, it's destroyed congregations. You might think, well, that's a pretty strong statement. Back that up. Galatians 5.26, Paul warning the churches of Galatia says, Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Envy is a major problem. It's something that we have to fight against. Envy is something that led to the Jesus to the cross. It's something that has destroyed millions of people. We should treat the sin of envy very seriously. I don't know about you, but I watch in the news and I see people stoking up they stoke up all this problem and all this dissent and all this angst and all. You know what they're doing? They're stoking the flames of envy. And when you do that, bad things follow. We need to get away from envy, starting with ourselves. It's a very dangerous sin. Let's go on. Probably the most identifiable sin that put Jesus on the cross, hatred. Hatred is capable of doing the most heinous of things to another person, and Jesus' life and his death is an example of that. You may have heard the expression, haters are going to hate. Haters are going to hate. People hate. Some people, they just like to do it. Some people can't hate but doing it or keep from doing it. Haters are going to hate. But hate is a very dangerous sin. It's one that we need to avoid. Hatred led to the crucifixion. Let's look at John chapter 15, 23 through 25. It says, He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. But this happened that the word might be fulfilled, which is written in their law. They hated me without cause. They hated me without cause. That's Psalm 69, verse 4. If you hate Jesus of Nazareth, 
you hate God. You hate the Father. That's, that's a tough sell with a lot of people today. They think that they can get to God however they want. They'll say, they may not say they hate Jesus, but they won't accept him as Lord. They may say, well, he's a good guy, he taught some good things, but, you know, I could take him or leave him. But you don't have that option. If you want to go to heaven, you have to go through Jesus to do it. Some people don't like that. Some people resent it. Some people, they don't like having to change their lives in accordance with the standards that God has given they don't like it. They want to do whatever they want to do. They don't like having to be subservient to anybody. Anybody. Even if it is the Lord of Lords. So what do they do? They hate Him. They hate God. They hate Jesus. They hate Christians. But what do they do? What did Jesus do that would create so much hate? But yet we know that it happens. In Proverbs 10, 18, we see that hatred is an ugly thing. Whoever hides hatred has lying lips, and whoever spreads slander is a fool. Hatred is very, very dangerous, and we need to take it very, very seriously. Paul wrote to Titus, and he said, For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us through the washing and regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by His grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We need to remember that hatred is one of the works of the flesh in Galatians 5.20. Hatred was what drove Cain to kill Abel. Notice this passage in 1 John 3, 10 through 12. Um, I'll read this one first. It says, In this children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not a God, nor is he who does not love his brother. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of the wicked one, and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil, and his brother righteousness. Cain hated Abel. Now notice he goes on, and John writes, Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life, because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murder has eternal life abiding in him. So, hatred is something that we have to stay away from. Murder. You know, you hate, you hate somebody. I hate him. I mean, what, you know, I hate him. It's just an emotion I have, and I just, you know, I just avoid him. And uh, it's, there's nothing really going to come of that just because I hate somebody. But you're mistaken. You're mistaken. Hatred is not a characteristic of Christianity. It's one that we need to take very seriously. We need to recognize that hatred is what led Cain to kill Abel. We need to realize that hatred was one of the sins around the cross. They hated Jesus because they envied him. They didn't want to bow to him. They didn't want to serve him. So as you know, we review these three, let's take a look at them again. You have the sin of ignorance. Ignorance led to the cross. And envy. The leaders envied Jesus. Even Pilate was able to very quickly <laughs> ascertain what it was all about. He was, very, he was very fast to come to the root of the problem. They may have been ignorant, but he wasn't. He knew what was going on. And also, they, they hated him. They hated Jesus. There were many sins or motives which contributed to the crucifixion of Jesus. And you know, we need to focus on them because if we're not careful, if we're not careful, we'll find these kinds of sins 
will keep us from becoming a Christian. And maybe you've become a Christian. And maybe you have left the faith. And maybe some of these sins we're talking about, if you sat down and you really thought about it, you might be able to see ignorance, envy, and hatred. One of those, or a combination of them, or maybe some of which we'll talk in the next lesson, they might be the reason for it. We encourage you to really think about it. Think if these sins cannot rear their heads and cause problems today? Well, remember what Jesus said in Matthew 23, 39 through 31. He said, and this is Jesus speaking, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous and say, If we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Therefore, you are witnesses against yourself that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. What's Jesus saying there? Well, Jesus was talking to the scribes and Pharisees. And one of the things they were saying, you know, they would go out and they would decorate the tombs of the prophets. And they would say things like, oh, you know, if we, if it would have been, if we would have lived back in the days of Jeremiah, if we would have lived back in the days of Isaiah, or in the back of the days, you know, of other prophets that warned them, we would have listened to them. We would have listened to them. But they weren't willing to listen to the prophets that stood right before them. Who were they? Well, that would be Jesus, John the Baptist, the apostles. So, you see, Jesus is telling them, you, you, know, you, you say, if we would have been alive back then, it would have all been different. Well, you're alive today, and look where you're at. Well, if you think that ignorance, envy, and hatred are just, you know, they're just three sins. They're not going to, they don't amount to anything. They're no big deal. You're making a big mistake. Those are sins of the heart. We need to examine our hearts and to give serious thought about these things, ignorance and envy and hatred. Whenever you hate somebody, when you envy them, I hope you'll remember that the sins, the, the sins that began, you know, back in Genesis, Cain killed Abel, his own brother. And the things that came from that, great destruction, great difficulties, Sin just goes from there. It's something to take very seriously when we think about it. You know, Jesus was perfect. He was sinless. He had no sin. He went, around, he went about doing good. He healed the sick. He mourned for people who, were, who had loss. He was somebody that the world, even the most, even the people that don't want to accept him, even people that want to deny his divinity, even those kinds of peoples in debates I've read, they still have kind things to say about Jesus. We beg you to think about Jesus, the Son of God, the crucifixion, the sins that put, it, put him there, and examine your life and think about these things. Thanks for watching our program today. Before we close our program today, we'd like to take a moment and review this roadmap to heaven with you since the matter is so serious. There are many incorrect set of directions out there and sadly so many people are following them. For example, some people have been given wrong turns. They believe things such as faith only, works only, or grace only. Or some attempt to change the order of the turns, being baptized before they even believe. Some people fail to realize what point they are on the map don't even open their Bibles yet and they think they're saved already. As a person travels in a car or takes a hike, has to follow the proper directions, so we must follow the proper directions to heaven. Let's take a look at the directions on our roadmap to heaven here. You have to look at these passages in your Bible for yourself. We'll just list the steps, the turns, on the way. 
First is to believe or to have faith. And then number two, to repent, to turn away from sin. Number three is to confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Number four is immersion or to be baptized, which is a burial in water to have your sins washed away. And then you're added to the church by the Lord, not by a group of people or not by giving some kind of testimonial experience or things like that. And then once you're added, you need to serve and worship the Lord faithfully all the days of your life. And that, the key word's faithfully. You don't waver. And that's very important. We need to keep in mind, too, that in Noah's day, there was a big flood, and only people in the ark were saved from the flood. The same is true today. There is no salvation outside the Lord's church. Where are you on the roadmap to heaven? Thanks for watching our program. Please let us know if we can assist you with further information for your journey.